There are three and a half desktop GPU manufacturers, over 40 current new models sold globally, and what, like a dozen different versions of each model? Conservatively, that's about 500 different graphics cards to choose from, ranging from trash and avoid to buy now and be happy. So today we're going to go over my process for choosing a specific graphics card, narrowing down from manufacturer to model, and then focusing on the pros and cons of the graphics cards within, to figure out what features are important to you and help you understand which card is best for your needs. Then and at the end, I'm going to give some great model suggestions for a variety of use cases. And then you can use what you've learned from this video to help you with the rest. Let me explain. So I have a question. Are you an avid PC enthusiast stuck with that ugly ass Windows watermark ruining your gaming and streaming experience? Well, I have great news for you. WhoKeys is a software licensing website dedicated to getting you affordable keys. And the best part is you can get rid of that watermark in a matter of minutes. All you need to do is head down to the video description, click the sponsor link and enjoy an additional 25% off using my coupon code TL20. With PayPal checkout and quick key delivery, all you need to do is hit the Windows key, type activate and paste your key right here to become fully activated. It really is that simple and that cheap. So head down to the video description if that sounds right for you. And thank you Hookies for sponsoring this video. So I'm assuming you guys know what a GPU does and why you need one, because whether you're a gamer, a streamer, or a professional, a graphics card is one of the most important components of your system. And choosing one of higher performance will lead to completing the task faster, increased frame rate, and even increased fidelity and resolution options. But how do you choose which one to buy? No, really. I mean, I've personally made many videos covering GPU performance and value, but never as focused as the pros and cons of size and how important things like aesthetics, RGB and design are. Should you even pay extra for them as they may not contribute to performance? Those questions and more are going to be the bulk of this video, comparing the benefits of specific versions within the model you are focusing on. When I say model, think something like the RTX 4060 Ti. And when I say version, think of the Asus Tough variant of the RTX 4060 Ti. So we obviously can't get to comparing versions without first getting a basic understanding of models, because knowing the model that you want is where you need to be to pick a version. Only then can you have a look at the options and use the information in this video to help you buy the perfect card. Let me show you. So there's two ways that I'll figure out which GPU model I need before I then look at which versions to buy. If all that I want to do is game, any manufacturer should be a consideration. Nvidia, AMD, and Intel. But if you do need it for a specific application or benefit, that decision may have already been made for you. And you can learn more about the benefits of each manufacturer in this video. But the way each manufacturer defines their models is by the company name, the graphics segment, the generation, the model, and then the suffix. Meaning the lower the character here, the older the card is in terms of generation. And the lower the number here, the slower the card card is within the generation. But don't get confused, because just being a newer generation card does not guarantee a faster card. There are generational improvements to graphics cards, but something like this RTX 3090 is going to far outperform the RTX 4070, even though this one is newer, with additional benefits. The 70 series class GPU just cannot match the previous generation 90 class GPU. So comparing specific models in the task that you want to perform is realistically the only way to truly know which one is better and is exactly why we do our best GPUs to buy right now series, where we compare GPU performance and value. And I promise to give you guys solid recommendations for a variety of use cases a bit later on. But once you know which models to focus on, this is where things get a lot more interesting and we need to start thinking about what you value most. So let me grab some more graphics cards and I'll meet you over at the main set. So once you've identified a model, you then enter the world of which version do you go for? And what are the pros and cons of each of them? Well, I have seven different graphics cards in front of me. They are different models, as in this is the 7900XTX, this is a 4070 from Nvidia, AMD, they absolutely are not related, but this is at least a good representation of some of the differences between versions. So why have I chosen these seven? What are the differences between them and why would you go for one over another? Well, card number one, what we have here is the ASRock Phantom Gaming, the 6600 XT. This is a pretty traditional version of a board partner card. We have some RGB, which is illuminating there and also RGB that illuminates here. It also has a standard eight pin power connector and is just over two slots long. This is pretty typical of what you would expect from a more budget to mid-range card. 
Here we have the RTX 4070 from NVIDIA. Now this is actually manufactured by NVIDIA, not ASRock, not Gigabyte, not Asus, not EVGA, not PMY, and definitely not AMD. But this one manufactured by NVIDIA is that's kind of a lie in itself because it's Foxconn that makes these. And if you don't know who Foxconn is, they are huge in the manufacturing of PC components. So what Foxconn have done is white labeled their service. And then Nvidia gets to claim that they, that they built these. So the reason that I chose this one is because it's a founder's edition from Nvidia being quite unique in that regard. It's not a board partner version, but also because of its cooler design. Now, this is an interesting card because not only does it have a traditional fan on the front, which is pretty much over the GPU core, mostly over it at least. And then we have a flow through cooler right here. And the fans are designed to pull the air through the card this way which is very much different compared to the ASRock card. Again, the more traditional board partner version of a card where there's two or three fans that basically blow onto the heat sink and it dissipates the heat anywhere that it can find. A cooler like this typically provides better cooling, especially considering sheer size. But the Founders Edition cooler is quite effective for how compact it is. Though you do need to consider clearance on this side, especially for small form factor systems, as this fan can easily be suffocated, which is less of a consideration for most other cards like this one. Here we have the Asus RTX 3050 and I chose this one because it's a single fan card. This would be good for a really tight small form factor situation where you really cannot afford the additional length but you have a bit more height on the PCI slot and you don't mind going over two slots for the total Z height. It also has a single eight pin power cable. In fact, talking about the RTX 4070 again, another reason that this card is pretty unique is that it uses a 16 pin power connector right there, which is a new 12 volt high power connector from PCIe SIG. And there's been a lot of speculation as to whether this connector is a good thing or a bad thing. The fact that it can supply more power is great. The fact that it's smaller is great. The fact that it has sense pins is also great. So it can communicate with the power supply and actually tell it what the requirements are for this card. Now the bad side for this connector is on some extremely high end GPUs, think 4090, the connector seating has caused a bit of an issue and has actually melted cards. So I understand for a lot of people that using this connector is something that they really are hesitant to do, but bear in mind that for something like the 4070, I don't think I've seen a single instance of the power connector melting on a lower performing card such as this. But even though this connector has benefits over the typical type I'm going to show you next, most people's power supply will need to be adapted unless it's natively compatible with the 12 volt high power connector. Not really an issue, but worth considering if you've already bought expensive custom cables. Now moving on over to this card. Now this is one of the heavier cards I own, that is Monster. This is the 7900 XTX from AMD, and this is the AMD Reference Edition. What makes it the AMD Reference Edition is that this was designed and kind of manufactured by AMD. And unlike the Founders Edition that uses the 16 pin connector right there, it uses actually 16 pins, but it's two eight pins, which are far more traditional. These eight pin connectors have been in the PC building space for longer than I have, which is over 20 years. And on a card this powerful, that was probably a really smart choice for AMD, as they haven't had to deal with a lot of the issues that Nvidia have. Like the Asus and like the ASRock, it is a traditional cooler. So it's going to be firing down and dissipating the heat out just wherever it can. And that's a very effective way to cool a GPU. One of the things that I like the most about this card, we have a Type-C port on the back. Nvidia used to do this with their 2000 series for their Founders Edition models. This could be extremely useful for a lot of people. Next up, we have one of the more bizarre cards that I own, which is the Nvidia GTX 285, the one gig version. And this is the PMY model. You can tell that it's old, the blue PCB and the blower style cooler, which is far less common nowadays. Instead of blasting air everywhere, like most other cards, including the Founders Edition, it pulls air from the case and forces it over the card and out through the back. And out of everything that we're looking at today, it's the only style of cooler that is designed to remove hot air from the system, which in principle is a benefit for all the other components inside the computer. But in practice, coolers like this are far less efficient at cooling and extremely loud. But the other fun difference is this fancy graphic on the front. This used to be a lot more common for GPUs where there would be really pretty artwork, or at least in some cases, pretty artwork that would accompany the GPU on the fascia. Kind of like a nice blast to the past, isn't it? And two DVI ports. I remember those days. 
Next up, we have the NVIDIA RTX 3060 12 gigabyte. This is an EVGA version, which is really quite compact. This is a fantastic card for a lot of people, including small form factor enthusiasts. Now, the benefit of, say, like the Asus is if you needed a bit of length shaved off, if you were in a really challenging situation, but you didn't mind increasing the Z height right there. With the EVGA, it is the opposite way around. What you're looking at is slightly longer, but a true two slot card. It is not exceeding unlike the Asus right there. And then we have the card in the middle, which is the Gigabyte Vision. And I mainly chose this one for aesthetic reasons because it has a brushed aluminium front cover. It is a white card, which is a little bit less typical. Still very common, but not as common as black. And the thing that's not very common about it actually is the purple on there. Uh, purple is actually my favorite color, so I really like that splash of purple. But being a very specific purple, it makes it hard to have a cohesive theme within the system if you can't exactly match those colors. So imagine all of these cards were the exact same model. Hypothetically, let's call it an RTX 4070. Why not? So all of these cards are RTX 4070s. Why would you choose one over another? So the first thing that you really should be jumping to is cost. How much do each of these cost? If this version is $100 more expensive than this version, they are both gonna perform pretty identically because they are both 4070s. I would honestly go for the cheaper version if it is that much of a cost difference. But if it's only a few dollars difference and both of them would work, what are the contributing factors as to why you should choose one over another? Well, the consensus until somewhat recently is that you would just go for the version that has the highest clock speed, the one that's more overclocked than a different version. And they're usually delineated in the model name as an OC version. But what do we mean by an overclocked version of a card? Well, the manufacturer, in this instance, Gigabyte, would go into the BIOS of this graphics card and adjust the settings so that by default, you are running faster. But that matters a lot less nowadays, as GPUs are designed with an algorithm for their boosting. If you have temperature headroom and you have power headroom, the card will just dynamically clock itself meaning that the fastest card within an entire model is typically the one that's going to cool itself better and has a bit of power headroom to play with. So cooling is very important. When it comes to purchasing a GPU, you pretty much want to choose the biggest one that you can fit in the space that you have it, which ends up being my quick and dirty recommendation. If you really don't care about too much, maybe RGB, really not that important to you, and you just want, again, a quick and dirty recommendation, get the one that's the cheapest price with the best cooler and it will probably serve you quite well. Which makes a quick recap so far, before I jump into the next controversial topic and category of this, is my order of priorities. Number one is cost and value. If these are all RTX 4070s, they will start at $600 with the Founders Edition, which ends up being a very good card to go for, as the Founders Edition is one of the cheapest. So spending an extra $100 on something like this with fancy RGB, some other features, integration into RGB software, ends up being roughly about 16% more cost for a couple percent more performance. That sounds like a pretty bad deal to me. So when looking for a specific version of a GPU, the cost ends up being one of the most important factors to me. After cost, we are looking at size requirements, especially when you're talking about ITX builds where you are severely limited in certain circumstances. So going for a smaller card, whether it's smaller in terms of Z height as a two slot card, or smaller in terms of length, they would be a really good second thing to focus on and falls hand in hand with the third thing, the cooling solution. As I mentioned before, typically the cooler card ends up performing better straight out of the box because of dynamic boosting, but it's also good for the card's longevity. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, all electronics have a finite life and it's not measured in hours. It's just gonna happen as heat cycles and it gets used. But keeping the card cool will always be better for the card. It doesn't heat up the core as much. It doesn't stress and crack the solder joints, which actually ends up being one of the more common reasons why a GPU dies, is just because of heat cycling and the way that solder reacts to that. But to you specifically, Something like the display outs may be more important than the cooling, especially if you have a very specific setup and you need a certain set of display outs. Most of them can be adapted, but I've definitely been in situations where the setup has been rather janky and using an adapter just wouldn't have worked. 
So I appreciate that display outs may be more important than cooling for some people, which means we need to talk aesthetics, which I'm kind of reluctant to do actually, because a lot of people say that aesthetics are not important, but as a buyer and a consumer myself and speaking to hundreds of consumers, that ends up being the primary reason why you would choose one GPU over another. A lot of people don't care about a couple percent of performance if the card is going to look beautiful in their system. So I'm gonna say something that I might get a lot of flack for, but I would say that aesthetics are a lot higher up than some of the other categories that we've talked about today. You want to have cooling performance that is adequate for the card. Being on the cheaper end of the spectrum is obviously ideal for your bank account, but realistically, most people are going to choose the more expensive card, even if it performs a little bit worse, if it's going to look better in their system. And there's a couple of things that contribute to that as well, because the physical and the aesthetics of a card is not just what we're looking at here. It is also the RGB. A card like this would look really good sideways in the system and also vertically mounted, as this fan actually illuminates and is a big reason that some people would choose this card over a more vanilla version of the 4070, being say the Founders Edition, which is exactly the same for a card like this, for example. Why would you put a brushed aluminium fascia on it? Why would you even make it white? A team of designers designed this card. And if you were to choose it for aesthetics, because say you don't want a black card, you would want a white one, I completely understand. And you were justified in your choice of choosing a GPU that is a bit more expensive based on aesthetics. But I wanna go back to the RGB very quickly because this card has RGB right at the top there and also on this fan. And I believe this card has RGB on the top, but in terms of which manufacturer is going to provide the best experience, this is where things get a bit controversial again, because Gigabyte, their RGB software is pretty jank. ASRock, their RGB software is better. That wasn't a compliment. And then Asus and MSI are going to have the better solution out of those four and they are the motherboard manufacturers. Now, the reason why I bring it up in that order is because there is a benefit to choosing a GPU from the same manufacturer as your motherboard, as it's going to integrate into your RGB software a lot better. You are not going to need a second application to run a single component, which can add overhead to your CPU, to your resources when gaming or doing any professional applications. If you're running more applications, they take more resources. And RGB, I understand having it, but to unnecessarily overwhelm your system because of RGB sounds like a really bad way to optimize this. So if you already have an Asus motherboard, choosing an Asus GPU may be a really good option if you don't want to run into RGB issues. There are applications that allow you to integrate all manner of RGB into your system and control them through one software. But the problem with that is they end up becoming quite bloated because of it. A solution for everything is going to have more overhead than a solution for a specific item. One more thing to consider is the warranty. Most GPUs have a three year warranty, but it may be worth getting a few first hand accounts online if you were particularly worried about the RMA process. So now that you know what some of the most important considerations are when choosing a version of a GPU, let's talk model recommendations for a wide range of use cases, including gaming, streaming, and content creation. From then you can find the exact version that's right for you based on what we just covered. Let's talk about it. So the way that I see it is there's five main reasons why you may need to buy a GPU, ranging from a simple second display to stuff like gaming, content creation, streaming, and other professional applications. So what I'm going to try and do is give you budget and high-end recommendations for those use cases. And these suggestions are derived from the data over at our GPU Smart website and the Best Value GPU series. So it's going to be more value orientated with product links in the video description and the comments section for you. If you found this information, helpful. But before you check the date on this video, we are going to be talking about the previous generation a little bit in these recommendations because a lot of the previous generation actually ends up being better value than current generation cards. But for use case number one, let's talk about a second display because this is probably one of the more common use cases that people may want a GPU. But realistically, buying a GPU for this use case may not even make sense. Let me explain. There's two different ways that I would go about this. I would either get the cheapest, newest graphics card you can find, as it will have the longest support moving into the future. But the other option that you may want to consider is maybe a USB to HDMI adapter. These things aren't great, but if all that you really want to do, like I said, is browse the internet or watch a video, this will be good enough for those needs. 
you're not gaming on it, but if you don't need to game on it, this will probably work fine. And the next use case is gaming. So what about budget gamers? What should you go for? Well, my recommendation for budget has been in the 6600 to 6700 range. Four GPUs that range from about 180 to $250 on a good day. And the 6700 has two gigabytes more memory. That's 10 gigabytes in total. A lot more than a lot of other cards within this price range. For NVIDIA, the RTX 3060 Ti, either GDDR6X or GDDR6 version. The 6X is newer and can quite often be found for around about the same price as the G6 version, slightly better as well. For high-end gaming, the best value ends up being the 6900 XT and the 6950 XT. Again, previous generation, but they are outstanding value at the moment. If you can get them for around $500 to $600, as they can quite often be found. For NVIDIA, the RTX 4070 Ti ends up being one of the best value cards for the high end compared to everything else that NVIDIA sells. Moving from the gamers to the streamers, what graphics card would I pick up for streaming, whether I had a dedicated PC or looking for a second card? So this is going to be more of the budget range, as this card is only going to be for streaming and not for gaming on top of it. So for budget streamers, I would honestly look into the A380, as it can be had for as little as $100 and supports a new AV1 encoding format. This is going to be one of the best bang for the buck streaming only options. Otherwise, if you gain and stream from the same card, I would honestly just get the fastest NVIDIA option that you can afford, as MVENC will be your friend, and playing the game whilst streaming is going to be a better experience on NVIDIA. This has actually gone in a pretty nice order. We've gone from playing the game to recording and streaming the game, and now we're into the content creation part, especially with editing videos and visual effects. We're kind of talking this style of content creation. While the 3060 12 gigabyte is going to be one of the best bang for the buck cards for this type of workload, especially with video editing and visual effects. A lot of them will use the Nvidia CUDA cores very efficiently, and the 12 gigabytes of memory is 50% more than most other cards within this tier. And that can be really useful, especially for demanding workflows or higher resolutions. I don't typically recommend AMD for this use case unless you specifically know that an AMD card will work better than an NVIDIA card. So you'll need to cross-reference this with the applications that you use. But for the high-end suggestion, this is one of the first times that I think I'm ever recommending a 3090. And the reason being is that the 24 gigabytes of memory can be really useful to a lot of people, while also being about 30% less than an RTX 4090. Same amount of memory and about 10% less performance. That seems like a much better deal than the 4090 if all that you want to do is professionally edit videos on a high-end card. You can even pick these up secondhand for incredibly cheap nowadays, though it may have been mined on like this RTX 3080 that we checked out a couple months back, where I compared the most mined on card that I could find to one that was very lightly used. And then for professionals, if you're trying to match to a very specific application, you really should be deferring to the developer's suggestion for GPUs. It's hard to give you a suggestion on this, but if you made me give a broad scope recommendation, the RTX 3060 12 gigabyte, the 12 gigabytes of memory for this price range is very, very nice. CUDA support, most professional applications will like these features. And the RTX 3090 being the high-end option. Or even a Quadro 4 ultra high-end, you're making a lot of money off these cards. It might be worth investing in one of those, but they are very expensive. So there are some great suggestions for a variety of use cases, but there's another aspect of a GPU that can affect performance, one that you can't even control. And the best demonstration of it can be found in this video, where we compared the Galax 4070 EX Gamer to the NVIDIA Founders Edition. And against specifications and common sense, the Silicon Lottery had other ideas for NVIDIA. And you can check that out by clicking here. Otherwise guys, share, like, subscribe, they are always appreciated, and I hope you have an amazing day.